Hello, everybody. Welcome to Man Watch Required, the inspection podcast. The only inspection podcast that uh, I think uh, I'm aware of. I did a quick Google search before we started it, but uh, I don't know. We're here to fill your inspection needs and hopefully answer your inspection questions. Hey, what do you think of that, Scott? Yeah, that's not, not <laughs> bad. The, uh, the only fun inspection podcast, I'll say. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not the most technical, maybe not the most informative, but it's a lot of fun. We, we try to do that anyways. So, Scott, we're on piping part three. Uh I feel like we kind of knew that it would leak into a part three, but also we didn't want it to go here, but we're here because I felt like I got robbed on my circuitization uh, <laughs> last podcast. We left it to the very end there. And I think it's the most, uh, one of the most important parts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a very key detail and that, not to mention killing the piping and getting into the repairs too. We didn't even touch on that. So yeah, it's, it's funny. We kind of had this idea to do a piping life cycle because Piping gets kind of disrespect, disrespected, if you will. And then here we go, disrespecting piping, thinking we can jam it into one episode. And here we are, episode three, or sorry, part three. Yeah, so I think it's good. Uh, I think this is going to be pretty helpful to maybe mostly new inspectors and maybe some inspectors that uh, maybe don't have a full uh, comprehension of why why we're doing stuff and doing in the inspections at certain locations po- possibly right so uh, to start off I think we do want to do a bit of a recap again uh, just to kind of cover like w- it's already been like I think what like almost two hours and 20 minutes of us just rambling on on what we think <laughs> uh, you should do from from the fabrication point of view and rolling into installation so uh, Maybe just a quick, we're going to try and keep it to, let's keep it to eight minutes, yeah, under 10 for sure. Right? Less than 20, yeah. Yeah, not like last episode. <laughs> <laughs> just spouted off at part one all over again. <laughs> yeah. So in part one, we did cover uh, mainly some stuff that is specific to Alberta, where we're from, Alberta, Canada, and uh, some requirements that our local jurisdiction has. So I would encourage you, if you're just kind of stumbling upon us now on this part three, go back to listen, go back and listen to part one. Uh, It is pretty decent. I I think Scott and I have listened to it probably too many times already, (laughs) trying to make sure that it it was at least decent enough for you guys and also to maybe follow up and answer any uh, additional questions that we thought we may have left people hanging on. So I think the first thing we want to kind of touch back on is aside from going to listen to part one is we talked about PSVs last episode, right, Scott? Yeah, quite a bit. And that was a bit surprising. I, I know we had kind of had PSVs as a little note to make sure we talked about that, but we did actually go on for probably half the episode about PSVs. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's and, and they are important. I mean, it's granted. I, I think we'll still probably maybe do a full episode on those at some point. But, yeah, I mean, just to recap, we talked about some of the, you know, what you'll see on the nameplate, the CRN requirements. They are required to be registered as well anywhere in Canada. Some of the set pressures, um, that type of thing, what they're protecting, what type of system, what the internals look like. Um, a lot of pretty good information, actually. I think we did a decent job of that in, in part two. So if you did miss that one, maybe go check that out. But but it is kind of a progressive life cycle we're trying to do here. So if, if this is the first one you're listening to, you, you probably want to go back to part one, have a listen about the fabrication, and then part two, and then and then this one. And it's, you know, the piping life cycle or circle, if you will. So we're, we're trying to keep it to that progressive. Yeah. Um, another thing we quickly want to touch on is just the installation inspections of your, your new piping systems. If it's not an installation inspection, it will be, you know, a, a basic kind of external inspection, but you definitely, you want to note any piping supports, um, any locations where the piping might be uh, skewed or uh <laughs> deflected i guess is the is the word i'm looking for right yeah and i think one of the good points we made last episode was about the pipe shoes being off the Mm -hmm. beams entire that's not necessarily something you'll see in new construction i I would hope um but that's something you might see eventually and you know just making sure your your dummy legs and things like that are supported adequately if they're just floating there they're not really doing their job guides and anchors in place that type of thing yeah uh Maybe something quickly. I know we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but if the piping system's insulated, you want to check the insulation condition. You want to check uh, the orientation of the cladding seam. Make sure it's not allowing the ingress of moisture from rain or snow or anything like that. Um, 
you want to check maybe some exposed flange connection. Well, I guess if it's new, but even if it's been operating a while and it's a, a new site to you, you want to check the flange connections for any leaks or weeping, uh, valves, uh, you know, especially around the valve stem and stuff, packing, you want to check that. That's beyond, okay, I'm already going off into a rabbit hole here. So 20-minute <laughs> recap Yeah, here. yeah. That's good good point on the insulation, though. I mean, especially those high traffic areas, too, where that gets beaten down pretty good, yeah. where everyone thinks that's a one next step on the ladder type of thing. You just walk over it. So, yeah, it's a lot to look out for there, for sure. Yeah, I, def- I remember getting slapped upside the head, actually, from a senior <laughs> inspector one day because uh, I chose to walk on the insulation instead of the step uh, stair step that was conveniently right, right there <laughs> yeah, conveniently placed there for people to walk over i kind of just walked <laughs> isn't that what the insulation's for so you can step on it <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's why it's made out of like aluminum foil so it can absorb that rain yeah it cushions the piping yeah <laughs> that's what it's for yeah um another thing i think probably something that will bring us into our inspection portion of this is our api class piping class review scott This is something you kind of mentioned as we were getting our whiteboard ready for the episode. Yeah, kind of an important thing. And I think we did a good job of uh, going over it in in part two. But I think it was maybe just another thing to bring up. Just the API uh, piping classes are one to four. One being the most severe and four being in some instances where you don't even really need to inspect it at all. Just depending on the situation. But I think that was that's some good information to uh, definitely have a listen to in part two if, if you didn't already. But I think that's an important thing to be aware of. And this is kind of how it correlates to your construction code a little bit as well with, uh, you know, like your class one being similar to your category M, class four, CAD D, that type of thing. And then it's a good kind of lead off into where we want to go with this one. I think we're going to spend a lot of time on this episode on the uh, system circuitization and uh, maybe get into the repair, some external inspection, that type of thing. So I, I think this is a pretty good uh, you know, jump off point, if if you will. I'll try not to use Frank's favorite uh, word segue here, but <laughs> 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 it's yeah. a good good way to get us started. Um, but I mean, before we get too deep into it, especially for any of your new inspectors listening, I mean, what what exactly is a 570 inspector? That, that is a designation you can have. And, and what's an owner's inspector? That's something that's defined um, by our construction code. Uh, B313. So there's kind of some differences there and they're also kind of tied together. I thought that's be a good starting point, Um, especially a lot of guys, like I said, new inspectors getting into the industry. 570 is kind of one of those things you go after right away. Um, I believe you're a 570 inspector, Frank. I am as well. So we might have a idea of at least how to get that certification. So maybe maybe we could touch on that just a tiny little bit and, and then maybe what an owner's inspector is. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, API 570, after our, uh, after, I guess after my CWB tickets was the first one I went after just because given I have a pipe fitter background, you know, it was, it was easily relatable and I could kind of transition into that, uh, especially because there's different verbiage and stuff in, in the API codes and well, standards, I guess, uh, from ASME and even from the Canadian Welding Bureau, which is CWB. Uh, which we're certified to for weld inspection. It's the equivalent of AWS. So, Yeah, it'd be a little bit more of your new construction side of things. And it's, I mean, unless you do a technical degree or something like that and, and jump right into the owner's side, this one of the paths you can follow, I guess, is kind of the fabrication side and then kind of lead your way into the uh, inspection repair alteration world, if you will. But um, yeah, it, it's basically, uh, depending on what you have for an education, you need a certain amount of years of experience in, you know, design, fabrication, any of those type of things in piping. And then you have to have, a th- I think it's for any instance, you have to have at least one year of inspection or supervision of inspection. So you got to have that bit of experience. And then for you guys just starting out that don't know how to go about that. I mean, your CWB one's the perfect way to, to get right into that. That's that you can get with, you know, a trade background or whatever you've been doing, get some QC experience. And then you can, then you can move into that API 570 and then, then from there, like the owner's inspector, that's one of the definitions they have is you have to have uh, the CWI, Frank mentioned, or international equivalent, which would be our CWB2, or 570 is another one of them with, uh, I think it's five years experience. So that's kind of how they're tied together. If you want to be an owner's inspector, you almost have to be a 570 inspector and have a certain amount of years of experience. Now, your your site uh, owner user manual may have 
some outs were deemed competent, you know, wherever that means exactly. <laughs> but if you're just following the code and regulations, that's kind of how those tie together. And, and that's how you become, you know, a 570 or an owner inspector or both. Yeah. So we got that out of the way and your owner's inspector, I guess, can be a 570 inspector as well. Right. So, uh, yeah, exactly. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to go back into that. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. Um, Another thing we kind of want to open up with is uh, what's within the scope of 570. And uh, it does give some optional, I guess, inspection, not maybe required. Well, I don't know. It, it kind of shows you what needs to be inspected and what kind of can be optional, right? Or what's not covered under the full scope of 570 that an owner user or an owner what am I trying to say here, Scott? Um, I, I guess just how you're going to apply your, your 570. Like, w- what's the scope of it and, and what's not part of the scope? And I, and I mean, if something's not in the scope of 570, that doesn't mean your site's not going to inspect it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it just lays out some baseline information for you. And, and that's all on past history and, and industry information too, right? Like uh, like your hydrocarbons, your flammable fluids, your feedstocks, your cryogenics, those type of things are definitely well within the scope. And then... You got like your deluge, like your fire water systems and, you know, things like that. Cat D, boiler free water. Some of those things 570 is not too worried about probably because the, um, if there is a failure there, it's not going to be overly concerning uh, or the chance of a failure is relatively low because there's not a lot of corrosion or, or uh, you know, temperature and pressure to see there in some instances. And then in some instances, your, your owner user program is going to pull that in and you're going to do some, some bit of inspection there, at least when it's new for sure. Thank you. <laughs> is, that, is that what you're trying to say? I don't know where you're going with that. Yeah, well, user. I was just thinking, like, obviously, it's going to outline some requirements for inspecting your piping, and then it's going to give you some optional systems, like you said, like your fire water and stuff like that, where, you know, it is plant critical that you have an operating uh, fire system, like fire water system, but it's usually l- left uninspected. And usually a lar- large portion of it is underground, right? Yeah, and a lot of it, like your dry stand piping, that it, it, there's nothing in it until it's used. So, yeah, there's really nothing to monitor there. I mean, yeah, it's if you have a fire, you want to make sure that's operating and your office people are going to shoot the water cans off periodically, make sure it works. But uh, as far as like uh, corrosion monitoring, there's not, not going to typically be a lot involved with that. No, which is also kind of weird because it's usually like, crappy like river water or something that's water, just yeah. all <laughs> all like microbiological corrosion some of the worst there, stuff right? you'll see yeah. <laughs> yeah so um interesting <laughs> so getting into now our piping's installed and we're doing installation inspections and stuff and we want to start circuitizing and and kind of breaking our plant up into systems so we can uh i guess identify how how and to what extent we're going to inspect the piping. Um, a good a good place to start is with a process flow diagram. And you can do it, obviously, it's going to be easier by unit. So it, pick the unit that you or your company or whatever you're contracted to do. You're going to take a process flow diagram, and it's going to show you the basic uh, flow outline of that unit. It's going to show you the pro, like where your feed goes in, and the product coming out and typically at that level you're identifying something called a system a piping system right yeah right that's a nice zoomed out way to look at it is uh yeah it's just a big like kind of overview look of your plant very basic of you know how the how the product flows through the plant it's not going to have every valve every line in there it is going to be very basic and and yeah systems a good way to think of like kind of the big overview so you're going to break your piping up into systems which you know would be one type of feed or one type of product typically um you know you, you may change that depending on what equipment it goes through but but that really depends on what what you got going on in your plant and then from there your system you're going to break it up into circuits which are going to be of comparable uh like design material uh process conditions operating conditions that type of thing uh, maybe something changes that goes through a piece of equipment. You want to start a new circuit there. Or maybe you have a metallurgy change. You want to start a new circuit there. Basically, what you're going to expect as far as a damage mechanism, if you're expecting a different corrosion rate in a certain area, that's where you want to have a different circuit and you want to monitor that. Um, I wouldn't say differently, but separately, because you might ex- might have different results in this 
circuit than you would the one you know upstream of it for example yeah and i guess for the uninitiated uh refineries are essentially broken up into systems so you will have like your feedstock or your your say your crude oil going in somewhere and it's going to follow a path to be either upgraded or refined and within that journey i guess air quotes there's going to be a lot of subsystems that are there required to heat or cool, uh, remove impurities and stuff like that. And some of them are closed loop, loop systems. Some, uh, you know, like a steam system, like you'll have steam going in and then you'll have steam condensate once it's all condensed condensed and it's lost its heat. They're going to co- recollect that water and turn it back into steam again. So these are all multiple systems working in tandem to kind of achieve a process goal i guess is that (laughs) yeah i guess so i I don't know if we're good doing a good job explaining this or not i think we are just kind of like a an overview of it but like essentially there's multiple systems in action in the refining so what we're going to do from this is we're going to break them up and inspect them either based on severity or damage mechanisms or even criticality to the process um some things like Scott alluded to is once you've kind of identified which system you want to go after, we're going to break that down in the circuits. So the next thing personally that I would do is I've identified this on my process flow diagram. I'm going to find which lines are in there uh, and I'm going to go to a PNID, which is a, a process instrument diagram. Yeah, piping and instrumentation piping, diagram. Piping in a, <laughs> it's like, how do I got to edit that out? <laughs> Holy shit. Piping, no, no, that stays. Piping in, what did I say? I don't know what you said, but it's a piping and instru- instrumentation diagram. <laughs> you said something about process, I think. I don't know. But it's <laughs> same letter, I suppose. I'm going to edit that it's out. It's like <laughs> kind of like a PDF, PDF kind of like your PFD, but if you want to look at it, is it like a little more zoomed in, I guess, a little more detailed. That's going to have a lot more of your lines, a lot more of your valves, kind of your flow direction changes, those type of things, critical instruments and that. So that, that's where you get into the to the circuits like Frank was saying so it's you, you have your kind of your zoomed out view which is your systems and then and then you take a zoom in shot of that and it's it's your circuits which make up your system so that's kind of how we'll start chopping that up next so you want to take your PNIDs right your piping and instrument instrumentation diagrams there we go and from there you want to essentially you want to highlight it color code it whatever yeah color coding I like I've on yeah. some of the more basic uh basic's not a good word to use, but some of the smaller facilities that don't have like a, a nice IMS program in place and you're kind of doing it, you know, off paper in Excel, that's a nice way to do it is, is highlight your circuits and your systems. I like doing that myself too. Yeah. And personally, I enjoy doing it with paper and then, and then doing it on a computer, but obviously you can go with a PDF editor and uh, just, you know, do it straight in your computer. But I, I kind of feel like with my age group, like we're kind of at that cusp where it was like doing it on paper is more satisfying and I feel like more (laughs) tangible than like just looking at one or two screens trying to figure it out, right? Like you want to flip through the pages, especially PNIDs, continuations and crap like that, right? Well, what's the nice, um, I think it's Bluebeam, right? That's the... The PDF editing program. Are you familiar with that one? No. No? Oh, it's it's a pretty nice program to use for... It doesn't... It's not like Acrobat Pro where, you know, you can mess around with everything. I guess you probably could. But it's really nice for um, color coding, like you said. And you can do it in layers. Mm. So there's um, one project I did, and it was kind of the old school way where we didn't have a lot of information and we are just, you know, running Excel and, and this and that. And we did it off pa- on paper at first. But then the finished product we gave to the client was all the PFDs and the PNIDs, we had them all highlighted. And you can highlight lines, you know, just like a highlighter on this program. And you can set it in layers. And then we labeled each layer as um, whatever the circuit series was. So say the 100s or whatever we call them, and then dash one to whatever it is. That's just a numbering system. That can be anything. So we labeled the one layer that. So you click that one on and it highlights all those. And then you can click on all of them if you want to highlight some all. They're all different colors. You can click one on, one off. And it was, did a really nice job, actually. I was, I was quite impressed. It was a lot of work, but for not having an extravagant IMS program, it was you know, a pretty good substitution. 
Yeah, no, that's that sounds like a pretty good thing. Uh, personally, I would do it individually for each circuit, though, because then people could delete layers or it's like uh, filtering in a spreadsheet, right? Like if you have exactly one yeah. thing, <laughs> one thing clicked and you, you don't catch it or if you're using a shared spreadsheet and somebody had it filtered a certain way before you get into it, your results might be just gone out to lunch right oh so, yeah operator error there for sure you gotta, gotta yeah. know what you're doing yeah, yeah. so uh you should have a p and id copy of your entire circuit uh highlighted specifically for that that's just my recommendation if you want to do them all on one go ahead but down the road it's going to be a nightmare trust me and i'm speaking from experience <laughs> on that no that that is a great way to go about it i would agree yeah um and when you're creating these circuits, like you want to think of things like materials, process phases and velocities, temperatures and pressures, uh, something that we don't really want to get into too much, uh, mix points and dead legs. Like I feel like we can do entire episodes on those as it is. Yeah, uh, I think so. There's a lot to discuss but there, but just maybe mention them as enough for yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, as we kind of go through it, we'll mention them as, as required, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously... You're going to have pressure vessels within your circuit. And this actually might be, uh, you know, you're, you can have multiple circuits within a system and it's not that bad. And you're typically going to want to stop a circuit or start a new circuit after uh, either a change in pressure or temperature or a change in phase, right? So if you have piping going, uh, you know, into a vessel and it's separating liquid, and then you have maybe a, a, a drier a, a, a drier gas stream coming off the top with liquid, liquids coming off the bottom. You're going to have two totally different circuits there. Like you might have a drain circuit and you might have an overhead circuit, which would continue on. So it, this does, like everything else in inspection, branch off. But, you know, typically you're going to... You're going to stop at uh, either phase changes, temperature changes, uh, uh, or even pressure. Uh, I know where a lot of instances we've done circuit breaks at control valves or pressure pressure control valves, right? Because mm -hmm. it's on the opposite side of that valve. There's a, it's, uh, ah, geez, man, my brain is not working today. <laughs> well, it so could it's, be a significant change in pressure or flow there, right? Or both. Definitely. Yeah. And, that, and that could actually cause a liquid to go to a vapor depending on, uh, right. on what it is. And then you're going to have totally different uh, characteristics on the other side of that pipe, right? Well, and a lot of times that's on a, a lot of times that's where you'll have um, a change in your piping line class, which mm -hmm. you know could be a completely different flange rating or, and, and maybe even a different material as well. Not always, but that's something to look out for. But yeah, I think the message there is just to know where you need to make these changes. Um, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be at every piece of equipment, but sometimes it does. You just have to know what's happening, what's coming out the other end, like the. Uh, Columns are a good example of that, where you have your feed coming in and then you have various different uh, weights of product coming out, different piping systems. They're all, you know, more than likely going to be different circuits at that point. So that is kind of an interesting example, I guess. A lot of columns in the refineries we work at. Well, realistically, the best example of a, a system where you can break up into multiple circuits is an aiming system. Yes, yeah, very good example. Right, because you're going to have rich and lean amine. Rich and lean, a lot of H2S floating around in there too. Right, yeah. and you know, and each side has unique damage mechanisms, right? And mm -hmm. even operating conditions where temperatures and, and stuff like that, where you need to regenerate your amine to get it back to a lean and it flows again back to your, to your co contactor. And... Yeah, that, that's a great example. The, <laughs> like uh, that's the best one. That is a really good one. The uh, the kind of example I gave about the uh, marking up the PDFs, that, that was, I think there was two amine units. They had kind of two trains set up, if you will. And yeah, they had two amine units. And that, that was definitely the most interesting one as far as breaking up the circuits or had the most anyways, or a lot, a lot of different changes. Um, that one was kind of difficult too, because there wasn't any... Um, materials engineers process engineers that type of people whether they weren't staffed or not i don't know but we didn't have access to them mm -hmm. uh, we did have the operations people so that's a, a bit of a help but um yeah that, that good point on the amine unit if if you want a good kind of run through on circuitizing that there's a good one to start with and just see what you come up with 
Yeah, it'll be fun too because there's a lot of interesting damage mechanisms associated with rich amine, lean amine. Uh, you oh, know, just the difference from where it goes in that tower and out. Yeah, it's impressive. And even types of amine. And I guess <laughs> I don't want to do this, but I do want to do this. Uh, if, if you don't know what amine is, it's essentially a liquid that um, r- captures impurities typically in like natural gas streams. I'll keep it really simple. So if you have, say, a sour gas stream, which means it has an overabundance of, of sulfur in it. I'm not going to get into levels or whatever, but we have sulfur in our gas stream. They typically run... Um, the gas through something called an amine contactor, which is a counter current flow vessel where you have the gas flowing up where, and the amine actually drips down through the vessel. And through that, the liquid comes in contact with the uh, gas and traps the sulfur or any other impurities like mercaptan, CO2, uh, CO, stuff like that. Once that amine, uh, it becomes saturated with these, uh, uh, what do they call them? Contaminants. Contaminants. Contaminants and impurities, right? I was going to say, maybe. Yeah, yeah, impurities is a great, is sure. a great one. Uh, <laughs> it gets regenerated by heating it up and you essentially boil all these impurities out and then the system gets recirculated again. Uh, that's why it's such a great system because you have a relatively, if you do it right, uh, a relatively benign service, I guess. Yeah, and especially your right. lean amine, right? That, that yeah. was a great way to explain it. And then um, you're rich when you're coming out of the contactor. You're going to have a lot of, you know, in some instances, a lot of sour, um, it was impurities, whatever we went with it. Yeah. But yeah, you're going to have a lot of H2S or high H2S content in there, you know, for some amount of time until it gets regenerated. So you're looking at, you know, two completely different damage mechanisms in a relatively short amount of time, just a quick process there. So, I mean, and that's where things where like your postal heat treat and that are going to be a lot more critical on the on the rich versus the the lean just a lot of things to look at there that that would be a construction thing you'd want to look at but it's also something you'd really want to pay attention to when you're circuitizing too you will actually want post weld on both because uh there is there yeah there's a few damage mechanisms that you want to check into but they're they're actually super fun and it's it's a pretty neat system essentially for yeah, I think we got another episode here that this could be a good one to talk about for, oh, yeah, for that 45 be, that'd an be hour. So, yeah. That'd be so fun. Actually, our uh, invisible friend, Matt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Should we just get a sock puppet or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the way to go about this. <laughs> he uh, actually has some super good experience with CO2 corrosion and uh, especially an Amy nice. plant. Uh, he, Matt is a part of the API 571 kind of uh, review commi- committee. And uh, during his application for that, he sent in uh, the plant conditions where he ran his amine mm-hmm. unit. And uh, he actually got a, a letter back saying that that was one of the most uh, acidic amine units that they've ever <laughs> encountered. <laughs> and they were actually pretty curious on how, we, how, uh, how that facility uh, managed the damage mechanism and stuff like that. So, Oh, that's uh, interesting. That's, so that's how you get on those committees. <laughs> then you got to share the good stuff. Oh, man. I think it was... Like the amine was like, it was almost like 62% CO2 it was taking. Like, oh, wow. It was like super like saturated carbonic acid like forming. Jeez, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. I, I think we could go all, all night on this one. I, I think we do got another episode here on that. That's uh, I'm already getting interested talking about it. So, yeah. It's super fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, a, that's a great one, I think. We'll have to take note. Long story short, I guess, kind of to wrap this <laughs> Where up. Where are we going with this? Their first... Uh, <laughs> amine regenerator corroded out in seven years and it was oh, wow. it was constructed of carbon steel so then they had a, oh. another one it was like a super duplex stainless steel that they used mm-hmm. uh, i don't remember replaced the entire vessel yeah i don't oh, okay. rem- i don't remember the exact specification but um it was like a numbered alloy like it wasn't it didn't oh, have like yeah, a duplex SA, would be like yeah. a 2203 or 2204 so something along those lines something like, like that a four digit. Yeah. Uh, all i remember it had like smo at the end of it as a des- designate i don't know mm, cool but yeah and it was super cool anyway anyway <laughs> so how moving on that, how long did that one last still still running it's still standing actually nice yeah um <laughs> From there, we want to... Uh, sorry. I, 
<laughs> oh man, poking my head out of that rabbit hole. So <laughs> once you've identified your circuit on your P and ID and like, don't be shy. Like you obviously don't want to break it up into too many circuits and you want to keep your circuits essentially based on similar operating conditions and damage mechanisms, right? So it could, you know, if your if your system, if your flow runs through a filter, right? It's not typically, you're not going to have too much of a difference in damage mechanisms on there, right? So you can include that filter into that circuit and including vessels and stuff into circuits i think is something we might quickly touch on a little bit at the end and we can actually most likely go over that in our vessels podcast that we're still kind of thinking about yeah i think we got a series kind of lined up for that it'd be similar to this but i guess there's obviously differences with the equipment side of it but yeah i guess similar right kind of a life cycle yeah. type of thing yeah that might even be a few more episodes Maybe that, yeah. That, that, there's a lot to lot to uh, dive into there, but, but yeah, good point with the uh, filters. That's a great example of, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to create a new circuit every time you run into a piece of equipment. You just have to know what's going on there. If there's like a filter is a great example. There's not a lot of change going on there, and really the idea is to capture similar um, expected corrosion and expected damage mechanisms. Is kind of the whole idea of this. Once once you have an idea that's it's going to change for whatever reason, pressure, temperature, you know, metallurgy maybe, that's when you want a new circuit for sure and kind of monitor it separately. Yeah, and once you have your your circuit identified on your P&IDs, this is kind of where I was trying to jump in at, is <laughs> we, we now want to start creating corrosion circuit drawings. And I am a personal fan of going out and drawing them by hand, isometrically, and then getting someone with some CAD skills to uh, create actual circuit drawings. Now, the facility we cur- Scott and I are currently at, um, it, it's split into like three different areas, and each area kind of manages, um, they all manage their corrosion program along the company standard, but there's a little variations and I guess little methodology changes methodology changes based on each group some groups actually have hand-drawn circuit drawings Mm -hmm. some some use the 3d uh like a 3d modeling um program yeah yeah and if you're at a facility and you're fortunate enough to have that where you have a 3d model of the whole facility and you can incorporate your um corrosion drawings into that that's that's great like that's i think the best way to do as far as you know technology goes because that's nice you can zoom right in on your 3d drawing walk around with the little guy there, pick out your, you know, piping circuit or your, just your piping you're interested in, click on it and it's going to bring up what circuit that is. And, and then there's your, your nice 3D circuit drawing and away you go. Like it's, it, it is pretty great technology if you're fortunate enough to have that. Yeah. Uh, whether it's digital or paper, I think the biggest challenge faced is actually updating the drawings as the piping ages, because obviously you may have changes in configuration you may have material changes uh i guess what other changes can you have (laughs) yeah yeah well and that's where the uh you know whenever you're doing repairs or replacements or upgrades or whatever you're doing it's something changes that's where why we always ask for as builds or why the client asks for as builds you know the idea is that that gets fed into the system the drawings get updated but you know that's not always the case and that's kind of where you can get in trouble pulling construction isometrics to create these corrosion drawings or to work off of because you know a lot of time i shouldn't say a lot sometimes they won't be reflective of what's there anymore you know the the configuration could have changed even significantly sometimes so yeah and i would shy away from using construction isometrics because the isometrics are essentially built for the fab shops where they can build small spools and you'll have hundreds possibly well, maybe not thousands, but you'll have hundreds of freaking drawings. That's why it's it's key to actually create a corrosion circuit drawing. And this can be comprised of several drawings, but you can actually cheat a little bit and it doesn't have to be to scale, right? So like if you have a run of pipe rack, like you can minimize that because obviously, you know, within your pipe rack, you should have fairly laminar flow until the end unless you have branches and yada, yada, yada. But generally a straight run of piping uh, you're not going to have too many corrosion issues unless there's some sort of process thing. But you can minimize that portion and then kind of exaggerate portions going to pieces of equipment or even to a drop-down valve station or uh, 
something of importance that you do want to highlight, right? Obviously, you might want to highlight uh, how many pipe supports are within that area and stuff like that. But your your corrosion circuit drawings should actually be a set, like a combination of all all of your isometrics from one point to another within your circuit. And I don't know how much more I can freaking explain it. But as you're creating these circuit drawings, like I said, I'm a big fan of hand drawing them and then converting them because you're actually walking them in the field and verifying uh, what's been installed. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point regardless of what you're doing. If you are working off the 3D model and doing it that way, um, I mean, you definitely want to be walking it and verifying that that is what's there. But that, that's another good point too with the isometrics. If, if you're leaning that way for whatever reason, um, yeah, you may end up with pages and pages of them to make up one circuit drawing, which, you know, you really don't need. A, a circuit drawing can be a nice overview, like your 3D model, your 3D sketch, whatever you got going on. Nice overview of, you know, it can't even be the whole unit, depending on how, on how long the uh, the circuit is or how you've broken it up. And it can really just include that that one line, and it's very clear. So, um, yeah, some good points there of why you, you know, wouldn't want to, Go with the construction drawings. One, they may not be accurate. And two, it, it's going to create a lot more work for you in most instances. Yeah. And, you know, kind of like a PNID or an isometric along the bottom of your circuit drawing or one of your, of the page of your circuit drawings is you can have the design conditions, material, corrosion allowance, all that kind of jazz. But you don't need to go into too much detail on the actual piping portion of it. Like obviously draw it isometrically. You want to, uh, excuse me, identify uh, pipe supports. You want to identify valves, flanges, uh, drains, low spots, high drains spots. Drains is a good yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, and they draw these in. And this also, this is typically done by junior inspectors as well, right? Like you're not... Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? But um, this does aid in your future external inspe- external inspections and also your repair plans because if you have these drawings... If you have a PNID level drawing and then you have a circuit level drawing and then even an isometric, if you ever have to repair a specific, I know I'm jumping ahead, but if you ever have to repair a specific <laughs> we'll portion of a, a system, you have all these drawings already compiled yep. and you can give that package directly to your coordinator or right to the field for the crew to, to do the job and they have all the information that they need, right? Yeah, it makes it that much easier. And, that, and that's anything, right? Um, the, the line of communication and the information handover. A lot of times those are the processes that get broken for whatever reason. But yeah, that that's some great points there. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're just appeasing me because I've been stumbling all night. <laughs> <laughs> I got to pump your tires a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so along with the creation of your circuit drawings, now is a really good time to start putting in your CML locations, right? Yes. While you're developing the drawings, you can draw in those circuit drawings. And if you're converting it to CAD or if you have a 3D model printout, you can draw them on there and then add them as a layer, most likely in that 3D model, right? So then you can print out what you need and you have all the the CML locations so you can give it directly to your NDE tech or your contractors and they can go out to the plant, they can find it, they can perform their... um, uh, inspection, whether it's RT, UT, or phased array, whatever the heck they need to do on that. Yeah, maybe even some surface stuff too, depending on what you're looking for. But yeah, those yeah. are the kind of volumetric ones you'd be after. But yeah, that's that's um, great with the um, marking up the CMLs and then inputting those into you know whatever kind of IMS program you're running, or even if it's just Excel. I mean, that works too, depending on the facility you're at and, and where they're at with their technology. But so yeah, yeah, you get all your CMLs in there, however they're identified, you know, with numbers, letters, whatever you're using, and then you're just monitor them. And then whenever they're up for inspection or if something's going on, you know, you just flag the ones you want to look at, pull the um, circuit drawing for your NDE contractor, or, or if it's yourself, whoever it is, and you give that information to them. Those are marked up. You have a request for them, which which ones you want, the UTRT, whatever it is done. And it just makes it very easy for everyone. They, they know exactly what they're going after. And you might have a little description on, you know, if you want a UT scan, if you just want a profile shot, RT, you know, whatever you're going for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it just makes it easier for everyone. Then they give you back the information you expected and update your IMS program and away you go. Yeah. Or, or you come up with a repair plan, I guess, depending on what you found there. Well, you know, like everything, like 
you need a strong foundation to build a strong integ- integrity management system. And that's kind of the IMS uh, Scott's been talking about, right? It's integrity management system. So you want to have as much support there for everybody performing the work, giving them the information they need so they can return with good information. And it's all information in, information out. So if you put crap information into your integrity management program, you're going to get crappy results out and you may be inspecting way more or way less, which is actually kind of worse than you need to. Um, Neither one's good, really. I mean, like no. over inspecting, that just gives you too much data and, and that can be worse too. And then there's more risk involved there. And then, yeah, under inspecting, you don't want to do that either, especially in a system where you do have some expected damage mechanism. You want to make sure you're capturing that. And it can be a bit of a needle in the haystack game, but you want to, you want to try to you know, increase your odds of, of finding that needle however however you can, right? Yeah. Um, kind of one thing I think we might have jumped ahead on with the creation of the circuits is uh, this should be a collaborative effort with operations, process engineering, and, en- you know, any engineering support you can get as required, I guess. Like, uh, you know, obviously you don't need to go talk to a static engineer, about uh, process conditions he's gonna look at you with a blank stare (laughs) he'll give you a name to somebody else to go bother yeah yeah. but um like like we kind of mentioned i think in in the last episode if you don't have these kind of resources you want to check uh 571 uh they do have some process flow diagrams in the back of that which give you kind of basic unit layouts with some uh, the most common kind of damage mechanisms found within specific areas upstream downstream of equipment because really you know all your phase changes and stuff like that are is happening within the equipment and being carried transported by your piping right to to the next spot so uh, yeah, great, <laughs> great point on that. It is, it's definitely a team effort. This is, um, we're talking about it from a, you know, inspection point of view, but this isn't the inspector doing all of this. Um, they may be doing a lot of it, but yeah, you, this is definitely a team effort. Um, even, even on a smaller facility, you know, some of the bigger ones, it's nice. Every unit might even have its own corrosion engineer and, mm-hmm. and that's great. And they're, and they're pretty available and, and there's a bunch of operators running around in that. And those, you know, that's the people you want to, form a group with, and, you know, your senior inspectors, kind of get all those people together. Um, and then even on a smaller facility, um, you're not going to be the only person employed there. So, I mean, you shouldn't be trying to do this all on your own. Um, if you are, you want to be researching it a lot and, you know, pulling some of the documents we've uh, mentioned in this episode and earlier ones. But at the very least, you're going to have some operations people there. Talk to them. At least you can get an understanding of the operations side of things. And, you know, there's probably going to be, you know, some sort of a corrosion engineer type of person maybe not at the facility maybe at uh, head office that manages all the facilities but just reach out do do your research it's a um, very difficult thing to try to do on your own because it, it really pulls in a lot of resources and that's kind of the idea yeah and worst case talk to the operators figure out what's happening do some research uh, api actually has a lot of good standards out there for different different processes um uh, Oh yeah, there, there's tons of them. Like I can't remember all of them, but uh, even like the 574, we're talking about systems and circuitizing. Like going back a little bit, if if you're new to getting to that, that's a good one to read. Give you a good base example. Yeah. If you don't have a, you know, corporate document wherever you're working at, you probably do. But you know that that's a good one to reference to. 570 gives you a good, uh, you know, high level overview. I guess without going into too much detail, but it kicks you to a bunch of other different documents. Uh, you know, the 571. A lot of good ones to reference for sure. Yeah, I think uh, actually API, getting back to amine units, I think it's 945 uh, is a, an RP on amine units and inspection of them. And it's it's a good read, actually. <laughs> like as, I'm as, sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> that shows you what kind of caliber of person you're talking to. They say an, an API uh, recommended practice is a good read. But it, it honestly is. like it, it gives you an understanding of the units and kind of what's happening in there and, and the damage mechanisms, which is uh, the most important part, right? Like, what are we inspecting for and how are we going to inspect for it? So that's some of the major major stuff you want to look at when creating a, a, a circuit for a piping system. Now, you do get into some other things, which I would say they're a little more advanced, but it's all a part of like a, a cohesive 
system giving you information on the condition of your uh, of your plant or your piping. So IOWs, right? Yeah, yeah, great, uh, great point. Your integrity operating window, and, and that's something the owner and the designer have to have to lay out and decide what that is. And there's a, I think we talked about IP on one of the other episodes, just to give them a little plug. But there's, yeah, there's always good presenters there, and there, there's one guy that always likes to talk about heaters and and integrity operating windows, and that's what he talks about every year. But it's it's great. Like he's got great information on there, a lot of wealth of knowledge, and um, yeah, it's essentially the uh, the minimum and the maximum your your system, your, your piping. Or I just mentioned heaters earlier, but your system or your equipment or whatever it is can operate at safely without kind of accelerating the corrosion or the risk there. And then some places take it even a little farther with like a design operating window where, you know, if you it's you can think of it as like a buffer zone. Is that a good way to say it? Where you know, if you if you get over that operating window, you kind of have a little cushion there before you're doing some severe design damage to the equipment, and now you're now you're maybe looking at repairs or, or definitely some intrusive uh, investigation, NDE, that type of thing. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good uh, pretty good description. The design operating window would be uh, watching the parameters of your process, comparing that to the design conditions of your equipment. So. Mm-hmm. Um, you may exceed pressures or temperatures to which your equipment was designed to. And uh, that's something that you can look at and then kind of determine what effect those uh, operating conditions had on it. Like Scott said, your your IOWs is your integrity operating windows and kind of the thresholds of your process where uh, you may see uh, increased corrosion or conditions which may promote corrosion so yeah especially if you go above and below those right the uh that's kind of the sweet spot that's where the the equipment just hums nicely along there as far as a corrosion standpoint and and you kind of know what to expect um once you get outside of those you're into the unknown a little bit and that's where you want to be careful and you really want to monitor those things yeah and i guess some examples i guess of iow's would might be uh ph uh dew point uh temperature which kind of is dew point, but like, yeah, composition too, yeah. right? So we we talk yeah. about uh, pressure and temperature, but yeah, your composition too. That's a, that's a definitely a big thing to yeah. watch too. Yeah, it's sulfur, uh, sulfur. Uh, geez, uh, you know how much sulfur you have in the system <laughs> uh, compared to what it should be, stuff like that. Even moisture and like once you get those two together, holy cow, you're you're looking at some fun stuff. But uh, just some common examples, I guess, of uh, IOWs and. Uh, a brief description of DOWs. So we have our systems. I'm assuming at this point, Scott, would it be fair to say we've kind of circuitized our plant based on operating conditions, materials, process fla- process phases or velocities, temps, pressures, uh, maybe some mixed point or dead late conditions. I, I, you know what? I kind of... Mixed points we touched on last episode, but dead legs is also like a really, really good one. And like, oh, yeah, no uh, doubt. Yeah, you don't want to overlook that either. It, it's a lot of fun, right? Yeah. And so, uh, again, a dead leg is an area of low or stagnant flow within a piping system. And kind of like when we touched, uh, we kind of talked about uh, heat sinks and maybe, uh, la- I think it was last episode or maybe episode one. We gave the example of an uh, uninsulated nozzle, which uh, oh, right, yeah. may condense uh, some some aspects of that process stream uh, if exposed. Dead legs are kind of the same thing. Uh, no, actually, it's a low inst- it's a low flow or stagnant area. But if you add possible thermal gradients or stuff like that, you can really get additional corrosion on top of that because even with the low low flow stagnant conditions you can have sediment dropping out uh causing uh uh, corrosion cells or corrosive conditions along the bottom portion of that pipe with the temperature gradient you could have you know uh condensing condensing acids and stuff like that again in those in those areas so uh dead legs areas of low flow or stagnant flow are definitely something that you should identify and should be a part of your system that usually comes as the system gets a little bit more developed yeah those are sometimes hard to identify um, especially when it's new like going with a yeah. life cycle thing assuming this is new at this point yeah they can be hard to identify sometimes sometimes you know they're there um sticking with piping you can sometimes create a dead leg that wasn't there um you know getting back to the old pipe support thing and you, you create sags in your line the insulation gets damaged and wet and and there's in, insufficient support there and you've got a big 
sag in a line that was relatively low flow anyways now you've you know potentially created a big dead leg that really shouldn't be there so mm -hmm. those are things to watch out for too when you know doing your external inspections and those type of things yeah so you know typically for piping as uh scott mentioned last time we typically can't fit into piping so <laughs> we're gonna rely a lot on external inspections external inspections and um our nde right from our cmls and yeah exactly we, we can't get in there so we got to have a look with uh nde technology ut and uh, x-ray and rt those type of things yep so um as we're we might have jumped over this real quick but as we're doing our cml uh creating our circuits like i said we can identify our cmls and we can also start installing uh cml ports and conducting our baseline reading so a port is basically a little access hatch or door on the insulation uh, which provides you access to the pipe surface. It's pretty easy. This does lead into CY uh, corrosion under insulation. If they're not sealed properly, mm -hmm. you can get moisture in there, especially with um, heat tracing, steam or electric, you know, uh, CUI is gonna be pretty, pretty prevalent. And, uh, you know, I think we did mention, I think in the first episode that we do kind of live in an arid environment, but uh, from my experience, CUI is, is pretty prevalent and uh, it's not respected here. Yeah, that's right. And and it's really your uh, operating conditions too, right? I mean, you got to be pretty pretty low and pretty high temperature to be out of that range where you're susceptible. So, I mean, uh, yeah, it is something to look out for. Um, a lot of things they've been doing kind of more recently is applying like some thermal sprayed coating. Aluminum seems to be a popular one, things like that, right? So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how those type of things hold up, but I, I don't think we'll go too much in, into that, but... Uh, I hate it. Yeah, <laughs> so just, uh, just some things that, uh, you know, different facilities are doing to try to combat this, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. I think that's a bit of a, a study, if you will. No, at this uh, point. Hey, look, <laughs> I, look, I'm tired right now, and I'm just going to open my big... <laughs> big mouth i think that <gasps> the ap the application of this external thermal spray which is aluminum and stuff like that is just a cop out because if you're doing proper external inspections and you're identifying any cladding damage or any damage to your insulating system which could allow moisture ingress fix it that's what the external inspection is for and it doesn't seem like external inspections are getting enough respect these days especially because Especially for piping, for sure. Well, yeah, you know, uh, this isn't only a perceived symptom at the facility we're currently working at, but also at a lot of other facilities where external external piping inspections are, are kind of seen as bothersome. It's a waste of time because sometimes it could take hours or even sometimes a day or two to walk down an entire piping system. Like I remember walking down a flare system and it took me probably two days in some of the units at the facility we're doing at, right? Because there's... Oh, yeah, it's no joke. It's a, there's a lot to look at. You know, there can be upward to 100 different connections into a flare header or more, right? Mm -hmm. Like from one unit, from all the different uh, pressure relief valves, uh, flare uh, dumps to flare, stuff like that, where you, that's part of the system. You have to inspect it, right? And that's how I see it. So you want to document the stuff. You want to... You want to set the limits of your circuits and you want to do external inspections on them and you want to identify that kind of stuff because some places seem to think, it, you know, the application of an external coating and stuff like that uh, is the solution and you don't have to inspect it as much because you've mitigated the possibility of external corrosion. It, but what, what effect <laughs> would that external spray coating or thermal coating have on your thickness readings now? And how evenly is it applied? Yeah, yeah, there's that to consider. And, um, you know, I, I get where you're coming from there. But I, I wouldn't say it's uh, intended to um, replace the internal inspection, or, or it, at least it shouldn't be. I, I think a big problem is, um, you know, when you do your piping walk downs and you find these, um, you know, damage to the insulation and things like that, it's very difficult to get that repaired. There, there's... Um, you know, a schedule and the cost that comes in at some point. And, you know, insulation isn't really seen as, as a critical thing in the maintenance world. No. I know I've been to a couple of facilities where, you know, we'll have some damaged insulation. We'll put a notification into their, uh, you know, SAP program or whatever it is they use, essentially notifying the maintenance team that this needs to be fixed. And whenever there's a 
time and budget there for it. They go run around and do it. And then you come back on the next turnaround and it's still there. So I mean, yeah. it's, uh, I mean, yeah, piping externals do get overlooked to some degree. And I, I would agree that a lot of places consider them like a, a nuisance. But then the other side of that too is, you know, the places that do a good job of it, it it's not always easy to get that fixed right away too. It's it's not the top priority to to spend a lot of your budget on getting insulation fixed. And, and it's unfortunate, but that's just kind of how it is. It's one of those things. No, it it definitely isn't. But like for the cost and and what it could save down the road, but are they really looking at that, right? Like, you know, what's it cost to have a few insulators go out there and, and repair it or recock certain, certain well, joints? Right? Like, I'm with you, but uh, <laughs> that's just not the world we live in, at least not yet. <laughs> I know, it bugs me. Yeah. We've I, I've even known inspectors to take a caulking gun out with them and, and caulk it, right? Uh, if, if they see some gaps or... Sometimes that's what you got to do, right? And even your inspection ports too. I mean, make sure those UT guys, when they're done, they're doinking there. They put those back too, right? <laughs> there's the there's a process of that too. I mean, you need to pull that plug out, you want to put it back. Otherwise, it's just a hole now. Yeah, and wipe the lube off. It's just <laughs> gross and crusty after, right? Uh, lube, lube is a... Uh, coupling? Yeah, it's coupling, <laughs> coupling. You need an interface between your surface and uh, your, your ultrasonic probe to kind of eliminate the air kind of as a brief description there to kind of get we'll, the we'll good get sound transmission. Yeah. There's an episode right there. Yeah, well, we'll need to bring somebody in there. <laughs> we got to find yeah. someone that knows what UT <laughs> is, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, moving along here. What should, what should we touch on here now? Like next inspection date, your intervals, that type of thing? Is that is that kind of the next... Where are we at anyways? Yeah. Could that be the next kind of step? Yeah, here, I think so. So with their life cycle? So API 570... Uh, does kind of guide you on your inspection uh, intervals and stuff like that. Since, as we mentioned in the opening, we're in Alberta, um, our regulator <laughs> does define some uh, inspection intervals. I think we touched on that last, we were talking about AB 506, which, yeah. which is the document. That I think that's when we clarified last episode yeah. too, what it is. So, I mean, if if you want a little more detail on that, maybe go back to, I think it was the, the recap of, Part two, we went into pretty <laughs> pretty good detail about that. Uh, or may, maybe it was one. I don't know. I can't remember now. But I yes, think it was two. It was essentially two. what it is, is our, our regulator tacking on a little more kind of what they like to do here. Um, but yeah, it, it just lays out your intervals. And if you don't have a program of your own in place, you have to follow that. That's just the way it goes. I think mm-hmm. we talked about maybe building a bit of a credit rating once you kind of have some inspections and some success with that you can start building your own program and then once you get your own program in place um, you don't have to follow that 506 anymore you can follow what's approved in your owner user program so you can stretch those intervals a little bit not so much in the boilers but getting to the piping and and those type of things sticking with our our piping topic Um, you can stretch those a little bit um, with your approved program and then even if you have an rbi program in place as well or so risk-based inspection you can stretch those out quite far too so that's that's a another thing to consider um the the 580 and the 581 are great documents if you're unfamiliar with those the api documents a lot of a lot of information there another good read for you but uh, just another source if you don't don't have a lot of knowledge on that yeah api 580 is risk-based inspection and actually our regulator does align with uh the time frame set by API 580, which is uh, you need to at least review your risk-based inspection plan every 10 years. Right. Right. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not like, oh, yeah, it's good. It can go indefinitely because, <laughs> you know, it's a non-corrosive service or we deemed it a non-corrosive oh, service. Well, that RBI will crank out some pretty long inspection dates for oh you. <laughs> it's funny it, sometimes. It is. Yeah. It's always on the I best. won't even be alive then. <laughs> It's, it's funny with some of the intervals it comes out with, right? But it's all input in, input out. Um, 581 kind of goes into more detail on risk-based inspection and kind of gives you uh, more detailed information on corrosion rates and the type of failure modes, I guess I kind of want to say. I'm going to be mm. a little careful on this Uh but it kind of gives you kind of expected corrosion rates from the industry, failure modes, like how, what is the most typical failures associated with specific damage mechanisms? Is the pipe going to blow out or is there going to be a small little pinhole that's going to weep, weep fluid out, which can, you know, kind of be contained by some sort of measures. So it's just, 
that's the kind of stuff that's in there. But we'll, you know, we'll leave that for another episode. I think RBI will probably be another like freaking two or three part episode. Yeah, that's a deep topic. And then even your fitness for service can come into play there too when you're, um, you know, you've kind of blown through your ranges there and you, and you just don't have the means to shut down or fix the equipment. There, There's another avenue you can go down there too. So that that's something I think we'll maybe leave for another time too. But uh, what is that one? 579? I think it's ASME slash API now or something or other, but yeah, that's uh, for the fitness for service. Fitness for service. Yeah, actually, I think. Uh, so yeah, that's another one you can, uh, another avenue you can go down here to another get out of jail card, if you will, I guess. ASME PCC3 is actually, I think, their risk-based inspection. Yeah, and I of. think they merged now, isn't it? Like ASME slash API or something. I, they, I think they've mashed them into one document in the last couple of years. I should probably know that. I do have my 580. <laughs> well, come on. You should know this. Yeah. So, um, you know what? You know, after essentially, I think the end goal for an owner user is to get onto an RBI program because uh, you're essentially weighing in your, your risk and consequence. And you can adjust your inspection program to fit the needs of the actual system instead of kind of shotgunning it, which is a term where you're picking random CMLs and stuff like that. But kind of going through the stuff we outlined in this episode, uh, identifying specific materials or process conditions within your systems, uh, that's going to help you refine your inspection program and then get into your RBI and develop an RBI program where, where Scott kind of alluded to with our regulator and even within the API world itself, you can start extending these inspection intervals. Not to It's not necessarily to save money, which is a side effect of it, but you're inspecting it appropriately. And that's kind of like the end goal is we kind of want to know or... I don't want to say assume, but we want to be aware of what damage mechanisms and what's affecting our system so that they can operate reliably and safely and, you know, uh, ultimately be productive and make money for the owner. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it too, the more effective inspection. Like essentially by doing this, you're going to cut back on a lot of your inspection, but you're really going to hone it into um where it needs to be. And then that's just, you know, increasing your odds to finding that needle in the haystack, as we kind of put it earlier, you know, to inspecting where you, when you know the damage is going to be or where you most expect it, not just kind of doing every component and every piece of pipe just, just because. So, I mean, I mean, a lot of that can be a waste. So if, yeah, if you can really fine tune that and inspect the areas that you know you need to inspect, that's great. That's, that's really the end goal. That's what you're looking for. Yeah. And you know, this is, we did call this a piping life cycle, and this is a cycle. Uh, I think the next kind of step would be, you know, we're, we're monitoring corrosion within our piping systems, within the circuits, and for turnarounds, we're going to start planning for replacements or metallurgical upgrades for, for areas which may have seen a bit more aggressive corrosion than we kind of anticipated, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that kicks us back into the repair, fabrication, or possibly alteration. For piping, the alteration, you know, really isn't that much different, right? You're either going to... Yeah, not really. Configuration changes and stuff, right? Maybe metallurgy upgrades, but it's not, you know, significant things like you can see with vessel alterations where you're changing a lot of different, you know, aspects of the equipment. It's yeah. it's a little more simple because there's not a lot... What is there to the piping? You got the pipe, the fittings, the flanges. I mean, there's not a, there's not a whole lot else there. And then what it's, you know, what flavor of metallurgy it is. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a lot else there, but yeah, it's exactly the life cycle. Once your piping dies and you got to repair it, you're, you're back to the new fabrication stage again, or um, you can abandon it in place is another thing, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, the, there's not a lot there, but there is a couple of things. I mean, you want to, you want to have that piping adequately cleaned and, and purged. I mean, especially if it had some sort of gas process in there, you want to have that purged. And if it's not a flange system where you can blind, you definitely want to have an air gap there where it's, you know, it can't jump into another process or, or even, uh, you know, capped off to some degree. And and you just want to be aware of this thing if you're leaving it in place. A lot of times you'll demo that, demo that piping, like demolish it, take it right out. But if you are leaving it in place, you want to be aware of it too, right? It's going to be sitting there corroding away for the rest of its life even though it's dead now, but um, yeah, at a relatively slower rate. But yeah, there's just a couple of things to be aware of there. You don't want to just totally walk away from it. <laughs> no, you don't. And uh, a lot of times, 
you know, they might not, uh, the owner user might not remove that section of piping during turnaround just strictly because of cost and the extra man hours, right? It's, it might be cheaper. Exactly, yeah. It might be cheaper to do it uh, after turnaround or a couple of years from now because they're not using it. They're not really going to care. Yeah, keep the maintenance guys busy picking away at it. You know, that yeah. you see that a lot, especially if it's a large system and it, it, it would be, you know, on, on a regular eight-hour schedule, weeks and weeks to remove it, then, yeah, that's something that's going to be left there or, or picked away at on maintenance type of thing because it's not critical to get it out of there. No. Scott, did we just complete the piping life cycle? Did we wrap that up too? I think we oh, kind of covered I think it so. well. I maybe I could talk about repairs a little bit. I think I think there's a couple. Yeah, you just want to get couple back points into I want to make. Yeah. Well, it kind of does circle back to fabrication. It's just the way the way it is. But I mean, there's a couple differences. We'll maybe talk about that as far as. Um, you're essentially going back to your new code of construction when you're doing a repair. So that's where you kind of lead away from those national board API documents. And then you go back to your, you typically your ASME, right? And you want to start following those f- to certify your repair and do those type of things. And then materials is another thing I want to kind of point out, especially your in-service materials. You want to be fairly certain you know what that is. I mean, when your piping system's new and you're setting up your circuits, it's a pretty good idea you're going to know what that is. But you really want to be aware of that. Um, you know, PMI is a great tool. I think it... Uh, it gets utilized a lot now, maybe even more than it needs to, but um, that, that's a great tool to utilize and know what you're welding to there, right? Especially when you get into the different uh, alloys, like the 300 stainless and that, they all look the same, but there's a variety of grades there. So that, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, flanges is something I want to touch on quickly too, like where when you, you know, you're inspecting a flange face, you, you know, your PCC1 and that are great documents. And I think our regulator is okay with that. But then when you go to repairing them, if you're going to do well, build up and machine them, you know, you're going back to your ASME document now. So it's not meeting that corroded acceptable condition of PCC anymore. It's it's back to your, you know, 16.5 or whatever it is, right? So you're taking it back to a new condition. So there's kind of a, you know, a bit of a border there you want to be careful of once you get into repairing it versus assessing it in the in-service condition. Okay, that was good. I like that. I just want to <laughs> acronym PMI. Ah. <sighs> Positive material identification. Is okay. that what it is? Yeah. And I also wanted to touch on something that other people might find interesting outside of Alberta is, I'm going to ask you this question because I know you know it, but <laughs> I is, hope so. is PCC1 a recognized document by our regulator? <laughs> so this is interesting. Um, we have a document, we have an AB document for repairs and It talks about API and national board and some of these um, good recommended practices as good information to allude to, but they are not adopted as accepted practices for for repairs in this province. That's not to say you can't use them for in-service inspection, those type of things, but they're pretty clear on when you're into the repair, when you know you're repairing this thing, now you're back to your code of construction. You have to know what that was, um, whether it's B313 um, if it's a flange face, you're going to go back to like 16.5 or, or 34 or whatever it was, depending on the size. So that's that's something you want to be careful of. PCC has got some great information on how to do repairs, and and it's kind of a, a little more of a in-service condition type of repair where our regulator kind of says, no, when, when we're doing a repair, let's kick it back to the new construction and, and bring it back. Now, I'll kind of leave vessels out of it a little bit because that's a, a bit of a different thing. But just for piping purposes, um, you're going to be going back to new construction. And and with that, I, I don't know if we talked about the hydro testing a lot in the beginning, but there is some differences there that you want to be aware of, uh, specifically around like hold times, temperatures, things like that. So your 31.3 and 31.1 just tell you like 10 minutes. It's not a real big specification for temperature other than, you know, above your minimum design. So you don't want to be in that brittle fracture range. But for your B31.1 piping... Um, when you get into boiler external, so that's the piping directly off the boiler kind of before the first isolation valve, that piping will actually kick you to ASME section one. And I think it's UG99 is the hydro testing one. You have to <laughs> have to look it up though. But <laughs> anyway, so that paragraph, um, it has a specific requirement of a minimum temperature of 70 degrees F or, or 21C, depending on who's listening. But that is a minimum you have to meet. And that is applicable to repairs too because our regulator kicks us back to the new construction. So that's something you want to be aware of too. 
I don't know, I'd, I'd hate saying a lot, but more often than it should, that one gets missed. And if the regulator is coming to look at that, because they will for boiler external repair work, unless you have it as part of your owner user program, they'll catch you on that every time. So it's kind of a, you know, I don't really see the point of it other than sure, boilers don't operate at low temperatures. So no big deal, but it gets cold here. So sometimes, you know, our later fall turnarounds and that it, it, it can be difficult to do a hydro test at 70 F and then, yeah, and then just around the whole times again too, like even if you're into that pipeline realm, so the CSA Z662, you get into your metering stations and that above ground, it's typically like an hour hold type of thing. Once you get to that mainline stuff underground, it's a lot of times it's 24 or even up to 48 hour hold. So those are some things just to be aware of. It's not always 10 minutes and it's not always a disregard for temperature. It's, you got to be careful what construction code you're, you're following there. Yeah. And maybe just a quick fun story. Uh, if you are kind of doing boiler piping, the whole portion of the piping being hydro tested has to be at temperature it, not just where you did the <laughs> weld uh i yes a couple, good point. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago we were setting up for a hydro and uh they didn't want to take the time to either hoard in the whole piping or actively ensure that it was circulate it was warm it enough yeah circulate yep. that's what i recommended but uh <laughs> some of the suggestions that were given to me were we're pretty funny, including holding tiger torches within the vicinity of the, of <laughs> I was the closure hoping, well. I was hoping uh, yeah. you are going to say that. That's yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. So I, just be aware that, you know, as the inspector, you have the right to tell them to kind of fuck off sometimes and do it right, you know. Yeah. And, yeah, and no it's their obligation to get them to do it right, to be honest with you. But don't take any shit. Like, if you know what needs to be done, do it the right way because ultimately, uh, you know, you're signing the AB83 or whatever at the end of the day saying that that piping system is good to go and the integrity of it is good to go. And Yeah, that's exactly it. You're signing as the owner inspector, not the foreman that's pushing the job. So keep yeah. that in mind. Make sure everything's met. Um, I can't remember. I think on one of the episodes I mentioned that paragraph on the, on the bottom. bottom of page two. Um, yeah, if, if you recall that, just give that a read. I mean, you write your company above it. You write your name and sign it below it. Just read what that says. Be aware. Um, I'll, I'll share a quick story on the hydros too. I think uh, this one might have, we were going to get into, I think last episode, but we didn't run out of time, didn't get to the repairs. But this is a instance where um, you're hydro testing to flange rating in new construction, which I promote as, as a good idea. This can come back to bite you sometimes, but this is more on the designer and them being aware of, of the piping system and the configuration, how it's isolated. So um I was on a job one time where we placed a section of a convection coil on a heater. And then there was a, down the line, there was a bunch of piping. Then there was a superheater. They're all welded. There was no flanged connections anywhere. And unsuspectingly, we had to replace uh, like a big 5D bend section. Or we had, yeah, we had to cut it out. Basically the new 5Ds. I think we salvaged some of the fittings. So anyways, whatever it was, we did a bunch of repair to the piping in between these two pieces of equipment. Now, the hydro test pressure 1.5 times to certify it new again was way beyond what um, both the uh, new convection coil and the superheater can handle. And we're more worried about the old superheater because it, cause it's quite old and, uh, you know, it's been cycled a number of times. You really don't want to overpressure that thing. So mm -hmm. there is um, a little out in the ASME code. I forget the paragraph now. It'd be in the 340s somewhere. But you'd have to. But, uh, <laughs> Just in the 340s. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, it gives you a little out for... Um, hydro testing and certifying new when you have equipment in line, when it's welded like that. Obviously, if it's flanged, you can control that. But when it's welded in line like that, and I believe it's 0.77 of design, it lets you hydro test and still certify it to 31.3 uh, new condition. So, you know, 77% basically of design. So that, that's quite a leeway. That's quite a big bit of difference between uh, your 1.5. So that's something you can be aware of. It's probably not going to be a new construction thing you'll run into, mm -hmm. but more so in uh, some of the plants where they've got this uh, piping all welded together and, you know, that wasn't really accounted for and the piping was way over-designed. That's a scenario where they designed it to the max where they really shouldn't have. They should have accounted for uh, the equipment that was in line that was actually the, the deciding factor, really, because you're, you're not going to overpressure that equipment. You can't. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And actually, that kind of sparked a thought like we need to wrap this up because you guys have already listened to us theoretically for like 
three hours and 45 minutes just on the piping life cycles, but... That's assuming that somebody who listened to part one carried on this far. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, but we feel sorry for you. Uh, When you're replacing a portion of the piping system, you want to make sure that the existing portions you're tying into with the newer material can actually handle that. And that Mm -hmm. is outlined in 570 and 574. Uh, So just on the to kind of take into account. You do want to do some thickness checks and and some NDE on the, uh, I guess the, the piping that's already been in service when you're, you're putting new stuff into. So yeah, check the corroded condition. And even with like re-rates too, that's usually a big, um, big part of the process for doing a re-rate is you're going to do a number of UT readings along the piping make sure you're not going to blow holes in it or something by trying to re-rate it. So yeah, that that's a great point. Um, how about closure welds? Did we talk about that. I think we did. Kind of briefly. Episode. I think we I think we mentioned that our regulator had some. Uh, uh, they had some requirements uh, above and beyond the code. There kind of was some recent changes to that. Uh, I think maybe a week or two ago, we kind of got an update email from the regulator, kind of specifying that. Uh, if you do have an owner u- user program, closure welds have to be a part of that and you do not need to contact them. But I think they had some before, like almost every closure weld they almost wanted to be notified of, right? Yeah, and, it, and if um, you don't have a 519 program, that's the actual document, so that's what they call it. If you don't have that as part of your owner's u- user program, you do have to contact them yeah. to get approval for every closure weld. So it's a big inconvenience for both sides. So that is... Um, and I think I talked about this one, but anyways, if we didn't, just to recap it, like the 519 is something the owner user holds, and then the repair company will have their uh, AQP, their QMS, approved for B313 piping. They do the work for you under your owner user program, and it's not vice versa. The repair contractor can't hold one of those programs. It's an owner user thing. Mm-hmm. And then really with that, it's an in-process. So you're watching it the whole time throwing all the NDE at it you can think of, and, and then a service test when you start the uh, plant up. That's kind of the extra things um, our regulator throws at it above and beyond what 313 says you can do. Yeah, and I know, thanks for listening so far if you've made it to this point, but uh, <laughs> maybe some quick things to look at is like you definitely want to check the fit up for high-low. You want to check the gap. Um, you're going to want to just generally check, like I said, the condition of the adjoining pipe in the new pipe. And let them weld. You're going to most likely do NDE after that root pass or hot pass, right? Uh, You're going to do it on the the completion of the weld. And then you you may do some supplementary uh, uh, volumetric and, like Scott said, the service test. So, and, you know, that is outlined in the construction code about service testing and stuff like that. So make sure you follow that. Yeah, it is. And I think the construction code gives you a couple outs where you you can exempt that, but our regulator doesn't really see it the same way They, they want you doing that. So... Just something to be aware of, a little bit extra there. All right, Scott. Can we... It's sign-off time. Can we kind of actually say we've gone through the piping, piping life cycle? I think so. We uh, told you how it was born and, and what you do to bring it, uh, <laughs> bring it to life in the facility, how to monitor it and, and how to kill it, and then start over again. Yeah, and actually, <laughs> one last thing I wanted to glaze over from last episode was that Scott actually came up with a pretty good sign-off that totally <laughs> went through one ear out the other. Uh, we were talking about C- PSVs, and he said, check your set pressure or something like that. Like I, I was actually laughing quite a bit when I re-listened to that episode back. I totally <laughs> missed it. Not in the moment, though. Just, oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so we're doing this late at night, folks. So I hope, you, weird. I hope you like it. I hope you appreciate it. We're having a couple of drinks, having a good time. So anything else, uh, Scott, before we wrap this up? No, I, uh, I think that's it. Maybe with the uh, repair topic, uh, just remember you're only as good as your last weld. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Have a good weekend, everybody. Or I guess we release these pretty early in the week. Enjoy the week. Hope this provided a a decent hour and 20 minutes or 15 minutes of uh, entertainment and education. Have fun. And I guess we'll be going into turnaround actually uh, next podcast. So I think we'll jump back into that and get interesting again. Some uh, turnaround stories. It's always good. Yeah. Scott's been doing a lot of TA prep, but anyway, see you guys later.